Airing on Asheville FM in Asheville, this is the Final Straw Radio. Over the first weekend of October of 2024, there was a deluge from two storms, including a level four Hurricane Helene, which descended on southern Appalachia, mostly on the eastern side, which includes Asheville and other parts of western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, southeastern Ohio, and northern Georgia. At the point of this recording, there are over 200 known dead and hundreds missing. Portions of the region continue to be without electricity or cellular service. The toxic mud and water linger and separate people from medical and community care. Also, clean drinking and washing water is unavailable to most people. This episode, we're speaking with three people who've lived in the region and have been helping other residents redistribute storm relief. If you're listening to this on the radio, please consider checking out our podcast for an additional half an hour of experience. Hey, call me Chris, Ian they pronouns, and I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. I do street medical work, both grassroots, and I have a medical job that has me on the street as well. Yeah, I wonder if you could talk about just your experience both as a resident of Western North Carolina and also as a medical professional and a medic activist around what the storm was like for you, how it's been. Yeah, well, it was looking like a serious storm. So, you know, I was at work Thursday and um, I made sure to do a couple of uh, smart things about like filling up gas tank and thinking about preparations then but then friday morning and you know hearing the news we knew it was gonna be pretty bad um, before i went to work but then uh it was yeah it just really slammed so a lot of people were caught off guard by the severity i mean i think pretty much everybody was caught off guard and unfortunately the extra shelters that did get set up the night before <laughs> Uh, had to be closed because of wall one was in a floodplain, actually essentially on the banks of the Swannanoa River. So it had to be emergently, emergently evac and it, that extra shelter was attached on, it's on the grounds of the veterans, almost shelter, specifically male veterans. And so that was all emergency evacuated in the middle of the night. And uh, many of the veterans are older and have are in wheelchairs or have walkers. And um, but it all everyone got out in that case, and the building was definitely inundated later. So this leads into the morning because they all all those folks went to the civic center here in Asheville, and everywhere had power down. The other shelter I mentioned was in West Asheville, and it lost power. They moved everybody out of there as well. Um, It wasn't flooded, though. So then the Civic Center became a shelter, but there were many problems. When I came in to work, it was already very severe wind and rain. And I went downtown, and within the first hour, everyone all the workers were ordered to finish what they were doing and go back to their home base and stay there for the time being because of the severity. But I was already in a building, um, a facility with homeless um, people with medical needs, a respite. So I stayed there and then found out that there, somebody came in, was let in the building who was outside they took shelter there and told us there were folks, a bunch of folks uh, were gathered up at the day drop-in place a block away. And um, there was a crowd and they were just in the weather because, you know, that, that place didn't open with everything going on. Um, so me and another coworker who wasn't there right there, but we met and just went out in the weather and took everybody in two trips up to that civic center place where their people were sheltering in the worst of it. I, me and my coworker, we got there and just because we were able to get there so fast and we're able to get them in the car and drive them up through debris coming across the road. In fact, on the second trip, I ran over something and it punctured both tires on the passenger side, but we made it up to the civic center 
and then had to park the car. It had two flat tires. And then we were in the Civic Center. So uh, like 100 plus, I mean, people kept coming. The National Guard was bringing people still in the big, you know, deuce and a half trucks. And um, there was, especially later when the, it had died down a little bit and the worst was over, the city buses were coming with evacuees from all kinds of low-lying places, various, you know, parts of the county. And we didn't have any power. We just had, like, emergency lighting in the Civic Center. And, like, five Civic Center staff and me and another coworker just, we just set up a impromptu aid station. So, which was very reminiscent of all the street medic work I've done. This was, I was doing the same thing that we've done at, whether it's training camps or, like, base camps for actions or mobilizations mass mobilizations, all these different things over the years. We had to set one up at the Civic Center. And uh, I think it certainly people would come and ask us for help for different medical issues. Or Most of them were, you know, minor headaches, cut, cut little cuts or whatever. Had a couple people that needed to really be in the hospital, but um, we figured that out. Also, though, to be able to just do, like, what's deal with what's in front of us and um stay keep our heads on make a little space hand write a sign this is medical and stay there have somebody there and have some supplies out of the vehicles and then be there to talk to people also mingle go around and mingle and check in i really think that is a very important thing to do if people find themselves in that situation whatever your resources are whoever you're with because it's a huge um psychological impact i believe like and people were people did express to us when we had to leave we ended up all leaving at, by nightfall um we just couldn't there was no way to get power to the civic center that was a snafu that the state did not foresee because they didn't look at it but that's a different topic <laughs> so the last little piece was we did help to uh, identify folks who had more acute medical kind of chronic most you know chronic issues pretty much, but they really needed um, more support. They, it wouldn't be good for them to go to a general shelter, um, you know, with hundreds of people and hardly any, you know, medical support there. So that's, the people were offered to go to a medical sh focused shelter instead of the general big one at the agricultural center in the county. So we, that was the last thing we did was help uh, more medically fragile people get onto a different bus and and then the next couple of days we mostly supported that shelter but there's a huge geographical like elevation dip between that part of of downtown on the side of the highway versus the hill that the hospitals are on that i i imagine was just like turned it into islands almost different hill yeah <laughs> yeah right yeah it was hard to navigate because uh, like i said one person was having a pretty serious issue that needed and they needed to go to the hospital and we just had to figure out a way to transport them over uh, as soon as we could safely do it and navigate the um the trees the debris the power lines definitely reminded me because i was in orleans right after katrina it's the reason i decided to go on and further my training and involvement in disaster relief and medical field but it definitely reminded me of that because of the i had never been through such a storm directly but I'm, one of my memories from New Orleans was how there's it's you have even just traveling anywhere have to be really vigilant about how you do it because so many hazards everywhere if you disable if the vehicle becomes disabled like ours did then yeah you're you're there you're stuck or if you get injured even a minor injury can become a much bigger problem because of the situation but yeah, the I was really glad to be on high ground for sure, since we didn't have to worry about the flood. And I don't know, yeah, that Civic Center is fairly old on Civic Center terms, I guess. <laughs> um, and I think that's part of the reason, you know, when the, uh, the local fire department brought a really big ass generator on a trailer that would have powered, you know, the building. I don't know how much those cost, you know, probably 50 plus grand. I don't know. But like, uh, they discovered by trying to hook it up 
that the plugs wouldn't match. And the reason the plugs don't match is because the amperage doesn't match. The generator would generate 100 amps. That building only takes 60. So, but there are converters, but, uh, or reducers, but they didn't have one. So yeah. I think that's the main reason that they sent us out from the shipping center because there would be no power for, I mean, I don't think there's power over there now. I don't know. How was uh, facilities at the Ag Center? Yeah, the one I saw that was on Sunday. I saw it last. Was a uh, there's a big building in the at the Ag Center there that was being used for all the cots and all uh, the sheltering. And there's a small kitchen in that building, but it's a big, open, you know, tall building, kind of like a small arena, I guess you could picture, but flat, you know, and um. It was not very good conditions when I was there because it also didn't have any power or water. It had They had a generator, a couple of generators, like small generators to try to power at least some people's oxygen devices, which is an ongoing issue. All the people that are on oxygen is the tanks, you know, people might have tanks, but they don't last super long. And then at one point I was actually there. Uh, and I think that was actually on Saturday when they had a generator that they were able to use for a little bit. Um, but then the rental company, it was a, owned by a rental company somewhere nearby. And they actually came and took it back. They repoed it in the middle of, <laughs> of like hurricane relief. They took it back in front of everybody, in front of hundreds of people. Just, yeah. I mean, I can, it's a private rental company. What do you think they're good? They're going to use it for make to make money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, but I think it's a good bet anyway. So that was, that was that. And after a little while, I found, found a couple other small generators and now, but now, I mean, you know, there's natural level resources there. That's like way better set up as far as resources. I'm sure their control and the police are also a much more reinforced there. And I, I can only imagine a lot of people just wanted to leave because of once the weather died down and things are much more regimented as they get when FEMA arrives. Um, there's a lot of people that I am working with a lot who already live on the street. They're very capable of survival in many ways. So... Uh, they weathered the immediate storm. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to see see who's out tomorrow when I go back to work. But, uh, yeah, things are – there definitely are resources flowing in. There's a lot of things getting set up. I haven't been down to the Ag Center lately, but there's a couple of shelters on the local community college. That's where the, that medical focus shelter was set up. And it was tough to get through the first couple of days there, too. It's a good idea to do that type of shelter however that's like where a bunch of people need oxygen machines mm -hmm. and you know you got like two tiny generators awesome but they need gas mm -hmm. you know <laughs> so it's it's a struggle people need water it's some i don't know who it was somebody some group came and threw down these this sweet porta john trailer it's like ready to go set it up Porta John, like four in a row, Porta Johns up, but there was like five steps to get into each, oh. every one of them. They're on a trailer. So almost no, nobody in the medical shelter could use it. Um, luckily, there was one Porta John that was at the ground level. So that was like another thing that had to be swapped. But it's all, it was like a lot of, we had to get, get through to get through the gap of, the immediate, the most severe part, you know, like the, the, I forget all the names of the phases, but there's like these phases of disaster, right? The immediate acute when there's rescues happening and people are having to scramble just for life. And then there's like the next part is where there's all the damage is fresh and people are still needing to get rescued some, but most people are looking for shelter, water, basics, you know, so we helped a bunch of people get through that second stage and 
now a lot of resources are coming in, pouring in, both, uh, you know, official, nonprofit, I should say. There's like three streams, really, right? Like, as usual, there's governmental, official, there's nonprofit, and there's grassroots. This is the Final Straw Radio on the Pacifica Network, and you just heard our chat with Chris, an EMT, doing care in Western North Carolina. I know that I am kind of avoidant to give donations or promote donations for NGOs or nonprofits, like official groups in a lot of cases, because a lot of money from those organizations, like Red Cross, can go into administrative position funding or lobbying efforts or other type things and not not actually get to the people that are directly needing the supplies or the resources on the ground, which is not to say that they don't do some stuff very well, but that, like, are there any good organizations that people might consider giving donations to that can be on the ground? Or how do they, what are good ways of determining if a group is a uh, trustworthy? Like somebody brought up, for instance, there's a group called Appalachian Medical Solidarity that um, has been raising funds and um, someone who was looking looking at their history was like, well, they don't have much of a pattern on social media over the last five years. They've been like off and on. Do you know what I mean? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think my experience is that, I mean, some groups are good on social media. I was just uh, actually just was reminded of um, what was that group? Tell tell me if I'm wrong, but was it queer Appalachia? Yeah. That uh, had a really great, sweet social media presence, had sweet merch was raising a lot of money for uh, good causes, supposedly. Yeah. Um, There's people can look up the articles about how that all. Yeah. There's a big New York times article about it. That seemed to go into a lot of detail about it. Yeah. So it's true. Like social media changes fairly rapidly in my, in my experience, as far as like even just platforms, pretty rapid changes. And so people are looking at different things and, that's I would say that's a you know it's good to have some media presence in that sense for a group I think but uh yeah also that's related to something I was reminded of when you mentioned the Red Cross and all the administrative costs which I do think are bloated and um, the Red Cross is so huge that it's it's essentially an arm of the of the government of the state in a lot of ways however they do last like chapters and their storage like they're ready. In a sense, they have this, uh, they last through between, between events is what I'm getting at. It seems like it's hard because I've been involved in different ones to, um, when there's not a lot going on in the sense of urgency and crisis and street actions or whatever to um, maintain infrastructure and, you know, maybe not build, but at least maintain structures of the the grouping, the literal, like physical storage, all that stuff, fundraising, you know, like I understand AMS is getting a lot of funds right now. And I'm not like so much that I, I think people are good to find other places because when one, when a lot of money goes into one channel, it can get a, become a bottleneck in that it can be a technological problem too. So, or just capacity. Um, yeah. So I guess I can just uh, say who I would recommend. And I know like mutual aid disaster relief does have a track record of maintaining some of their systems, their fundraising, they're an, they are an official, you know, nonprofit, very close ties with the gra- grassroots. And it's like, essentially a, it's a grassroots organization that is a, an official nonprofit that, is has integrity and in, as far as i know like i've worked with them in different in different places and in different instances so i would recommend them and there's some other local places um there is a i like rural organizing and resilience i guess it'd yeah. be one that we've interviewed before on the show i don't mm-hmm. know what their like online Definitely. presence is but roar does good work right they have a basic website and they have a facebook they definitely have a fundraising place to do that people can send to. And I know I've been in touch with them. They're rocking it in Madison County in particular and some other of the more rural areas right near Asheville. And um, there's a, some would, I don't know what their presence is on media, but they do have some fundraising channels. And I know uh, directly that 
folks are already have been bringing in supplies as well and um, spending like spending the money, getting the supplies, bringing them back into the area. So like maybe if we think about disaster and access to resources in terms of marginalization, like geographic or cultural or or economic or whatever. A lot of the most affected people by a lot of the storm are the people that were already pre-existing like in marginalized positions, Um, which is cool that Samud is doing things or members at least are doing things. And another element too with what we mentioned with Roar is that they work in rural areas that are often disconnected from resources and where a little change in the infrastructure can really cut someone off from access to fresh water, to electricity, to heat, to power um to medicine yeah the immediate thing i it's real important for people to remember that we all have blind spots and so you know coming into an area i think it's a good principle to be invited and to not just necessarily show up and that's a savior (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean i get it if you don't know who to talk to but yeah i mean there are people on the ground already and and it's very heartening to me I haven't been through this before directly at where I live. I've been to several disasters to plug in. And I mean, we're only from Friday, right? It's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And there's a bunch going on already with, I just drove into town and I'm, I saw, I mean, just in my drive, I saw at least a half a dozen distribution sites at different places, like an elementary school, a fire department, a couple of churches, you know, just, uh, and then just restaurants that have food are just cooking it and giving it away. No one turned away, you know? So it's like, I think, you know, going through COVID and other experiences too, but a lot of people remembered or kind of built up their, their solidarity muscles, so to speak, and uh, are ready to, yeah, ready to to do what is in front of them to cha- you know face the challenge in front of them, and not wait for the state or the big, you know, huge nonprofits to uh, start it up, get us through. I mean, of course, most are you know re- going to rely on. I think I think yeah, most everybody's relying on the the re- kind of like reanimation of the uh, you know <laughs> industrial. Uh, society here all the system the big systems the, the hierarchical systems to uh provide again sure however i think there's progress at least i feel like there is just in my direct experience that and we going into like thinking about people who are living more on the margins in general every every day under capitalism and under different oppressive systems there's there's so much to learn when I'm at, when somebody tells me like shares some knowledge with me at work, that helps my own survival too. You know, that I'm so grateful. And I always, I, I feel like we're in, like we are in this together. And I say that out loud to people in the sense, like not to try to be not, I don't feel like it's a fake thing. Like, yeah, we're here. I'm standing here next to you. <laughs> but knowing that this is a long emergency a disaster i think that's the name of a book actually the long the long emergency but like where we're going like where the future is now the disasters are happening everywhere and capitalism and systems big the big systems are getting just less and less effective at providing what we actually need so i mean this hospital here got bought out by the biggest hospital company in the country and they're so huge and rich and the service became so much worse everybody saw it everybody sees it there would it was a, like a mini disaster on a random tuesdays ems workers ems ambulances would have people patients on their stretchers for two plus hours waiting just lined out the door into the parking lot because just on a regular day because the hospital is too damn cheap and they wanted to break the union they want to break the union still that had just got established you know by understaffing and being cheap and all these things so not to get on a tangent there but that's an example of things that we need to face and basically find ways and this is yeah this sucks and it also is an opportunity 
to learn about people who are our neighbors, to meet new people, work together, find ways to deal with this, and le- and remember those things and ma- maintain some relationships. Um, yeah, long haul, right? I remember out of the 2008 economic crisis that capitalism created, you got a huge infusion of people living on the streets because their housing was taken away from them. Similarly, after COVID, doing mutual aid work in Asheville, where like so many other places, the narrative is that people are being shipped in from out of town. They don't they don't belong here, or whatever, and they're living on the streets and using our resources for folks that are housing precarious or who are on the streets. Every time there's a crisis, like it's it's people who get pushed out of their housing often don't have the resources to move to another city. And so a lot of the most of the homeless people that are in Asheville are people that have lived in Asheville for a long time. And with all of the damage um, that was done by the storm, like between people's houses being washed away and roads being washed out and flood damage and, and mud everywhere, like how do you think this is going to be impacting the homeless population in Asheville? Yeah. Well, I think people can look back to New Orleans for some clear lessons there. Also, I just, you know, think about a guy who I've, you know, seen and encountered in my work. He had just got in the house, like it just got housing and got placed, you know, like a week ago. And a big ass tree just went through his house and he was in it. He told me the story and now he's back on, you know, now he's back on the street. Right. And is that house going to be, what's going to happen to that house? You know, I'm probably going to be fixed. What is it going to be? You know, the effort and money to fix it. You know, who knows how long that take will take, depending on who actually owns it. What would they do with it then? Are they going to keep it into, you know, in a program that uh, people can get placed for housing? Yeah. Good question. And then all these other rural places, there's a lot of damage in some of these rural places to the I mean, outside of Asheville, like it's rural pretty quick and um, hard to tell what what's going to be, uh, what's going to be the, the future of that, of those houses or, you know, those areas, those neighborhoods. I see. I mean, I've, from what I've seen in the past, people will rebuild on the same exact place where everything was destroyed in the past, like Lower Ninth Ward, for example. But then well, I don't know, what is it going to do for gentrification? I don't know. I mean, part of me is like, yeah, those disasters are recurring faster and faster frequencies, severities. There's a point where, yeah, it just is, uh, it, it counterbalances the things like gentrification at some point. It's yeah. going to be really hard for, I mean, I'm thinking about the, like the, the housing projects here. You know, I see, like I literally met, uh, the CEO walked up to me on, I think it was Saturday. The CEO of a big, like, kind of retirement community that has also has um, some assisted living buildings, and I'm pretty sure it has a, a actual skilled nursing facility in it. It's a big place, really nice, high end, right? And the CEO, like, walked up to figure out how to make sure, you know, his people are going to be provided for. And then on the other hand, like, where's the public housing? Now, I don't know. I don't know everything that's going on. Um, I don't know what the, the CEO of the, you know, housing authority here is doing necessarily. I, all I know is it's true that people in those projects are not getting the same service. And who's advocating for them to get that? The babies, you know, yes, elderly also. Um, but also you know, families with very small children, infants even, who are needing the diapers, the, the formula, the supplies. Um, I know that grassroots people are delivering those now. So we got that. Yeah. As you said, blind spots, you know, best we can do right. is like, try to reduce them and, and move forward. Well, Chris, thanks a lot for having this chat. Yeah. Do you, any other any other things you want to throw in? I've kept you on for longer than I said that I would. No, I appreciate that people are are getting involved. Like I said, we we gotta check ourselves, we check our savior complex. You know, there's no heroes, heroes. That's just a way. That's actually just a, a mechanism of manipulation. You know, having been in the military and other 
jobs where, you know, we're called heroes just really to convince us to sacrifice ourselves. That's uh, something that separates us. We need to get past barriers, whether they're social, institutional, and uh, so that we all can uh, not I survive and also thrive. So appreciate people getting ready. And yeah, that's the, that's the last, that's my final thought. Like maybe it's me, but let's not just be adrenaline junkies. Okay. <laughs> let's build and at least maintain it at a plateau. So that we don't have to rebuild a bunch of it when the it's the fan again. They called it a 500 year flood. Darkness descended on the blue ridge. This is the Final Straw Radio on the Pacifica Network, and you just heard our chat with Chris and EMT doing care in Western North Carolina. And next up, you'll hear Margaret Killjoy of Live Like the World is Dying podcast about disaster relief in southern Appalachia in the wake of Hurricane Helene. My name is Margaret Killjoy. I use she and they pronouns. And while I am currently recording this from West Virginia, I spent Two days down in Asheville, North Carolina, I was on a book tour when all this happened, and I decided I have a lot of prepper stuff because that's one of the things that I do, and I was connected in with mutual aid disaster relief to a certain degree, and I have a large van. So I drove a lot of equipment down and was there for two days and just got home about an hour ago. When you say all this happened, could you give a, like, if if someone, I've talked Mm -hmm. to a surprising amount of people who are just like, Oh, really? Could you just give like a real quick rundown about what just happened? Yeah. One of the things that's wild is how few people know what's happening. I was in Blacksburg, Virginia, which is not very far away from Asheville, North Carolina, and is in very much a very similar bioregion. And people, of the two people I talked to while I was buying supplies, one person had no idea what was happening there. And the other was like, yeah, that's because no one pays attention to things in in Appalachia. Everyone abandons us. Asheville, North Carolina and the surrounding areas managed to be in sort of a perfect storm of it wasn't just the hurricane. Okay, so this part is a little bit rumor, as in this is a part that comes from talking to someone on the ground rather than me having done my own research. Simply the weather pattern that caused this, there was, according to a friend I talked to on the ground, there was eight inches of rain before the hurricane hit, the day before the hurricane hit. And it roughly was like, imagine a zipper of two storms coming together. And so already... Uh, Appalachia has been in a severe drought all summer. So then eight inches of rain for people don't normally keep track of how much an inch of rain is. An inch of rain is a lot. If it rains an inch in a day, that's an awful lot of water. It got eight inches of rain before the hurricane hit. So if you see at the areas most affected by the hurricane, and it's kind of curious about this area inland getting it worst. And it's just sort of a a terrible, perfect storm. Asheville, North Carolina was, and the surrounding areas, and and those often get forgotten, but there's a long list of them. Western North Carolina and parts of Tennessee and were hit with very severe flooding. A lot of people think that mountains don't flood. Those people have not lived in mountains. They simply flood in a very different way than flatlands flood. Mountains because of the hollers, which is the area between the hills, when they flood, the water runs down and is channeled into these places. And so you actually get this very strong flooding, but it's a little bit more of a network of floods rather than like the entire area underwater. But unfortunately, those areas are also where we put our roads and we're also often where people build their homes. Yeah. So this is millions of people throughout the region that have been left without electricity, without cellular connections, without water supplies, effectively and without, in a lot of cases, because of the those like geographic disconnections of the haulers um, mm-hmm. or the branches, isolated from yes. each other. Yeah. So um, I guess, so I guess stepping to a different question from here, and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll get back to this. Like you've been living in, in Appalachia, in different parts of Appalachia for a number of years. And so you, you've you had experiences with the way the terrain is structured and the way weather falls and, and such. But you also do a lot of thinking on emergency preparedness. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like about Live Like the World is Dying and the concept of community preparedness that you work through there. Yeah, so... I'm one of the hosts of a podcast called Live Like the World is Dying. It's a community and individual preparedness podcast that I started because I was getting into being a prepper. 
I actually started probably in about probably about 2016, sort of collecting beans and rice and things like that, because of some conversations I was having with a food land use engineer friend of mine about the possibility of food shortages. In 2020, I finally decided, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and make a podcast about this. And this was January 2020. And so the first couple episodes were like, I'm doing a prepper podcast. And then immediately COVID hit and prepping became more popular, unfortunately. Well, I mean, fortunate that prepping became more popular, unfortunate why it had to. And the core idea of live like the world is dying, or at least my approach to preparedness is that we're often presented with this dichotomy between individual and community, everything, uh, preparedness included, but also just life, right? The entire 20th century lives in the shadow of the Cold War, where you have this authoritarian pro-communal system, and then you have this pro-individual capitalist system. And, you know, these get presented as as these opposites. You have to either pick the community or the individual. And I and... I would say probably sort of universally anarchists reject this dichotomy. And one of the ways that that applies is in disaster preparedness because community prepared. Okay. Most preppers talk about individual preparedness. And when I'm making fun of that, I call that the bunker mentality, the, or the, I've got mine you mentality, which is the problem we're facing at the border right now, because I think the right wing is aware of the climate crisis and just doesn't want to admit it. And that's part of why they're like battening up the hatches, right? It's because they understand that bad things are coming and are here. So I have no interest in the bunker mentality. Yet at the same time, the way that some people talk about community preparedness is only about community resources and networks and hubs and things like that. And those are absolutely essential. But I believe that individual preparedness is a very useful part of community preparedness, and I have never felt more certain of it than I have in the past few days. Because when I showed up in Asheville, first of all, one of the reasons I was able to show up in Asheville is that you don't normally want to respond and self-deploy to disaster situations, right? And when you do... And, you know, I didn't self-deploy. I collectively deployed or whatever, right? I came down with a small caravan of people and connected in with some people ahead of time. But you have to be prepared to be individually self-reliant. So I made sure that I had at least one week, I think I ended up with two weeks worth of food and water and other basic necessities available to myself. I went down in a van that I can sleep in. I as part of the caravan, made sure that we had extra gas. I also was like very aware of the gas in my car. I basically did everything I could to make sure that I would not become in any way a drain on resources. And the more prepared someone who is living in the crisis zone is, the better prepared they are to help other people. And you could see it right away on the ground. Because most of the time in a disaster situation, Your first priority, and this isn't selfish, your first priority is making sure that you have your needs met and that the people around you have their needs met. And once you've done that, you can start thinking bigger. And now a lot of having your own needs met involves coordinating with people around you, right? But a lot of the people who were first out providing things were the people who were saying things like, well, I was okay. You know, I'm okay. Because if your house wasn't washed away, which happened to a lot of people, but not most people, If your house wasn't washed away, your problem is that you have no food, you have no communication, and you have no water. And so people who have those things available because they're prepared were immediately out helping people. And sometimes it looked like, you know, I talked to, I mean, I basically sort of just cut my prepper stash in half and brought it down. And, you know, I talked with people who are more prepared inside Asheville who were like, yeah, I kind of just did the same thing. I About half of my freeze-dried food went out immediately, you know? And so, yeah, I hate the dichotomy between individual and community preparedness, and I've never been more convinced that it's a false dichotomy. And I've never been more convinced, you know, people have asked me, you know, how do you support what's happening? I know I'm running on a tangent, but it'll be worth it. People have asked me a lot, how do I support this? You know, and if you're far away, if you're close, usually the answer isn't drive in there, right? If you are connected in with groups, including self-organized groups and things, and you can be self-reliant or reliant with the people that you're going in there with, maybe going in is useful. Maybe. 
But if you're within a day's drive, coordinating to get supplies there is necessary. And so people have been setting up hubs all over the southeast and the mid-Atlantic and, you know, from coming from further away than that, where people are setting up places for people to drop off supplies and then drivers are then taking them into Asheville. And then inside Asheville, drivers there are taking them out to the surrounding areas. And so if you're able to do that, because you're about a day's drive away, do that. And if you're further away than that, you can donate. You can donate to Mutual Aid Disaster Relief. You can donate to Appalachian Medical Solidarity. I'm sure there's a whole list of folks that you'll be shouting out. But if you don't have enough money to donate, or you've kind of donated what you can, right? You know, I've, I've, in these days, everyone, we all need money all the time. I would say the main way that you can help is to start taking preparedness seriously as an individual and a household so that you're in a better position to take it seriously as a community during crises. Because Asheville was, oh, there's some newspaper, I can't remember, picked it as like the number one climate haven in the United States a couple years ago. And, uh, well, what does that mean? There is no haven on planet Earth from the warming planet Earth. This is the Final Straw Radio on the Pacifica Network, and you're hearing our chat with Margaret Kiljoy of Live Like the World is Dying podcast about disaster relief in southern Appalachia in the wake of Hurricane Helene. Despite the fact that for the last, you know, for however long, I remember this from when Occupy was happening, Rosetta um, from Rosetta's Kitchen Mm -hmm. was doing a bunch of research into food deserts and looking at how destabilized the area was whenever there was a cutoff of distribution of food because there's not food produced at any scale in that part of Appalachia. The grocery stores only hold food for like three to five days for the amount of people that are there. And I think that we've heard that stores like Ingalls uh, were actually locked down at a certain point and not selling what was on the shelves for whatever reason because they were afraid of looting or uh, whatever. Yeah. But so even those food stores, and let alone that there were, you know, there is like a food bank in the area, but all that stuff would dry up pretty quickly. Yeah. So there's, I've seen that. I've seen that when there's been uh, a breakdown of gasoline, for instance, and that's messed up trucking. A couple of years ago, when the Colonial Pipeline, um, those uh, cyber attacks oh, were happening, yeah, uh-huh. uh, our area was out of gas pretty quickly within a few days, and there were huge lines around the corner for all sorts of people. Yeah, and I talk to pe- person after person. One of the main things I talk to people on the ground about, because I also went there as a journalist, although I, you know, that was sort of the the afterthought slash the way to justify it to work. Um, But, you know, I asked everyone about their own preps and what did and didn't work and what they wish they had done. And, you know, everyone gets kind of lazy about stuff here and there. And one of the things I talked to, you know, I talked to a friend who said, who, who had a lot of stuff prepared at home. And she was like, well, I only had an eighth of a tank of gas when I got home the night before. And I didn't bother getting more even though I sort of knew a storm was coming you know and that's not because that person messed up that's just what all of us do and so there are things that we we just have to make certain things habit you know that's not really the I was just thinking about those gas shortages there was a two kind of preparedness that you were talking about the individual preparedness the community preparedness Mm -hmm. mindset which you know they're not fully disconnected from each other as you pointed out I wonder about what you witnessed because there has been like a governmental response. There's, um, FEMA and National Guard have been showing up in Boone and uh, Border Patrol has been showing up. And I'm sure a number of other agencies have been appearing on the ground. Some of them like FEMA set up the shelters at the Ag Center across from the airport in Asheville. And I'm sure has been facilitating distribution points for, for water and food variously. There's also the other element of the way that the government interacts with crises is um, like in the name of FEMA, it's, Mm -hmm. it's um, the management of an emergency. Did you see or hear anything about like people being stopped from bringing in aid or blocking people's access to certain areas, blocking people from returning home, any of that sort of stuff, or like, the centralizing of distribution hubs um, so mm-hmm. as to be able to manage that that would maybe leave like more decentralized communities behind? So first of all, my bias is I want to find things that the government is doing badly and talk about them. That said, I have attempted to follow up on every rumor that I have found of these things while I was there, and I did not successfully follow up on a single rumor about 
people being blocked from providing aid. The closest that I found was some of the people driving into some of the more remote or the smaller towns, a sheriff stopping people, saying, no, no one can come in. And the people were like, oh, we're, you know, our car's full of diapers or, or whatever it was. And the sheriff was like, oh, well, you can come in. You know, and I'm also aware there was a, a highly publicized news story that's that's outrageous about a helicopter pilot who self-deployed to go rescue a bunch of people and then was threatened with arrest. Whereas I've also talked, and this is also kind of on the rumor level because I didn't talk to the pilots. I also heard about other sheriffs or you know local police in different areas when helicopter pilots were like, "Hey, I'm going to go try and rescue people." They were like, great, we'll shut down the airspace for you. You know, we will make this happen, right? And so it seems like there's a lot of confusion about what federal disaster relief looks like. And there's a difference between, for example, disaster response and disaster relief. I passed a lot of, oh, I forget the name of the agency, but it was a different agency that wasn't FEMA. I passed a lot of their vehicles on the road on my way in. You know, it was the federal disaster response something. You know, I, I don't know. And... And I was like, hmm, that's not FEMA. How many things do they have like FEMA? And more and more, I've been learning FEMA is an insurance company. FEMA shows up to finance things. One of the things that came up is that FEMA is aware that volunteers do most of the work in this kind of situation and that the organic structure, in some ways, it's almost like the government not doing some of the hard work and getting us to do it instead, right? But as compared to so the people who are there for response versus relief, response is the immediate thing. A lot of the people who are looking for these shorter deployments tend to be military types, law enforcement types. And these people have a problem when they see structurelessness. And they're like, our goal is to impose structure upon this. And that's a problem. It is a problem because certain circumstances, I would argue in most circumstances, do better with an organic and dynamic structure rather than a rigid and hierarchical structure. However, the kinds of people who show up immediately uh, from the government often tend to be more of the enforcement type. This is, this is the best way that I, I had it explained to me. And so that said, there have been so many rumors about so many things. There are rumors about road blockades, for example. And no one I talked to, you know, I would get be getting these texts about road blockades into into Asheville, and I they would be describing roads that I'd just driven on, and then I was like, oh, they must have set it up afterwards, and then I someone showed up ten minutes later and was like, no, I just just drove on them too. I might be eating my hat in a week. It's possible that these things are are more of a problem than we expect, but I actually think. One of the things that disasters do is get us to drop some allegiances and our allegiance becomes humanity. And that includes oh, those of us who claim that our allegiance is humanity this whole time, you know. And I think that there is more, don't get me wrong, there are people who show up and try and enforce structure. There are people, you know, Katrina was a really good example of this, right? There's always government or militia types showing up and deciding that law enforcement is the single most important thing. And those people are dangerous in multiple ways. But I I think we can exaggerate them and uh, and accidentally create a sort of um, a tension between formal and informal disaster response that doesn't always need to be present. And when I talk to disaster response people, I often get the sense, like I know of Anarchists who boss around National Guardsmen on a regular basis because of disaster relief work, you know? Yeah, that's going to call me a liberal for this. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a little bits and pieces of information are kind of coming out right now concerning there's a couple of chemical plastic plants in that region of um, southern Appalachia that have been affected by the storm. There's the story in eastern Tennessee of the factory the plastics manufactory where six workers died because the floods came through and their bosses wouldn't let them go home. Uh, and then there's the fabrication spot in Woodfin, which is just north of Asheville. The French Broad, which is the main river that goes through Asheville, actually flows north. And so downriver, but north of Asheville, there was water, uh, a bunch of solvents appear to have been released into the water with some of the flood. And there's um, people are people are reporting rashes and, and burning 
of their eyes and their nose from inhaling dust and and starting to feel effects of it. I wonder if, I mean, obviously this is, you're not a chemist, you're not a doctor, but I wonder if someone who just came back from there, if you've heard similar things to that. Most of those rumors, which I, I give a lot more credence to than some of the other rumors that I was just saying that I might be wrong about, but I don't specifically trust. Most of these rumors uh, started today as we record this, which was the day that I was driving away from Asheville. However, you know, that said, every disaster does this. And so I have every reason to believe this. Um, and, you know, that's part of the man-made part of natural disasters is how not just that we do all of this heavy industrial work right which is you know people have complicated feelings about i have complicated feelings about but the fact that because they're private industry and because they're beholden to stockholders and capital yeah they don't they don't prioritize not having negative impacts on the environment in case of crisis and storm you know i, I was talking to someone about uh it's sort of tangential, but a place that sells really nice outdoor gear and they didn't empty it before the storm, even though they had every, they're right on the river, you know, place is just totally destroyed. You know, basically people are sitting around being like, oh, where are we going to get a bunch of water filters? And someone's like, well, I know there's a bunch of water filters, but we can't have them. They're underwater. Because, yeah. And they're under like poop water, you know, never use a water filter that's just been submerged in a flood forever, you know? I was hearing a few days ago about people having rashes in Madison County, and it was explained that it. because of kerosene and other chemicals yeah. in the water. But I mean, one downside, I think, of the response of large agencies like FEMA or like like the Red Cross or mm -hmm. other agencies showing up is that they don't, while they have, they have resources, which is amazing, and they have the science of deploying them in certain centralized ways down, preparation for disasters based on community networking and relationships mm -hmm. with your neighbors seems like a really important thing, especially if you don't have the ability to go down to the ag center, you don't have the ability to get yeah. down to the ingles where, you know, whoever is deployed and handing out, handing out food. So I, yeah, could you, I don't know, is talking to your neighbors like a, a thing that you really want to talk about right now or is that? Yeah. And I, I know I kind of just defended the federal response, and I don't really mean to. More just I want to, you know, say that we're not certain about certain things they've been accused of because I want to be accurate when I discuss them. There are fundamental problems with the way that the central... I know this is kind of only... It's part of what you said at the beginning, but it's not the last thing you asked. But there are fundamental problems with this sort of centralized and bureaucratic method. And we've been learning that even the, you know, the Department of Homeland Security put out a paper... Uh, in 2012, you know, saying Occupy Sandy was more effective than us, basically, it's, you know, because the decentralized network was able to uh, fill in gaps, but it's more than filling in gaps. It was agile. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and it's something that I run across all the time, right? I used to work in um, cooperative economics. And during the beginning of the pandemic, worker cooperatives sub survived the shutdowns substantially better than traditional businesses, despite the fact that people claiming that traditional capitalism is like, you know, somehow better at economics or whatever the f like cooperative businesses did better because literally because they were agile, because they were able to respond in, in different ways, because they could have different uh, priorities. And so there are certain things that you sort of need the big thing to do. But there's no reason we can't be doing the big thing. And like regularly, like just before this call, I was talking to someone from a large international NGO who said, hey, how do I get some supplies that are supposed to go to our site to these sites that are decentralizing it out better? You know, because people want to do that. Because at the end of the day, people's allegiance is to humanity. And uh, or... People forget that and their allegiance is to bureaucracy and control, in which case they get in the way of people trying to get done. But like small crews with chainsaws get stuff done, you know, and many hands make light work. So but in terms of, yeah, talking to our neighbors, you know, I mean, this morning I woke up to the 70 year old or so couple who lived behind my friend's house coming over and thanking us for the water that we dropped off at their house the day before. And then they, they brought us news about what was happening, you know, in uh, a different town and being 
blurry about all of it on purpose. And, you know, oh, we went to go see our son who works in this different town who works for the such and such city department. And here's what they know. And, you know, we're all sitting there talking and they don't care that we all have weird names and are dressed funny. And, you know, because at some level you're just like, well, do you need D batteries for your radio? I have them. And my other favorite moment of the whole thing was I was sitting outside my friend's house and this guy drove up and he, you know, got out of his car and he was like, water? And we were like, uh, what? You know, and he was like, do you have water? And he wouldn't come near us. And we were like five subcultural people wearing black sitting around in the front yard and he was not subcultural driving a nice car, right? I understand why he wasn't immediately like, I'm just going to come up and talk to you. But he lived nearby and these people hadn't met him before, right? Because he lived in a, you know, one of the sort of fancy new houses on the street. And he, after he found out we had water, he asked about each individual house near us and made sure that all of those people had water and wouldn't leave until they did and then left. And the thing I loved about that interaction, at no point did I get the impression he liked us. And that didn't matter. Whereas the other interaction with the, you know, neighbors, you, you were, we're friendly, right? You know, and, and there's some subcultural barriers have broken and generational barriers have broken and cl- maybe class barriers, but I don't know, you know. And, but, but that's not always going to happen, right? Sometimes you're going to be like, oh, we're still kind of, we don't want to hang out. You got what you need? Do you need anything? I'll get it for you, you know? And, um, and so in some ways, you know, people worry, a lot of the stuff that people worry about with preparedness, those problems sometimes melt away after disaster. And that's not to say we shouldn't be prepared. We should be prepared. But for example, the, the, the knowing your neighbor's stuff, you know, if it's hard to talk to them when it's not a crisis, it might be easier to talk to them when there is crisis, you know, because you know why you're talking to them and they know why you're talking to them. And so a lot of social... Uh, flooding is a good social lubricant. If you're listening to the live version of the show on the radio and want to hear the rest of it, check out the podcast version at our website or on various streaming sites listed at tfsr.wtf. You can check out the show notes for this episode at our website, as well as you can find links to groups that you can donate to or get involved in. And soon there will be a transcript available for reading, printing, and sharing. Some of the groups named in this chat that are working on the ground in the region include Mutual Aid Disaster Relief, Appalachian Medical Solidarity and their partners Scorch Medics out of Pittsburgh, Pansy Collective, and Rural Organizing and Resilience, or ROAR. These formations will have info on local needs available at their either web pages or social media if you can find them there, as well as donation sites that you can bring goods to for folks on the ground, or ways to get involved in preparedness yourself where you are. Remember that we are the relief. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org.